Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. Mysteries is our theme for the show this week, and I mean to keep it. Good job, I guess. We have stories that include a 10-year-old mystery of death and murder that comes back to haunt Raymond. Who's that? Jim is back with another strange tale from New Mexico, the land of enchantment. Also, Tyler tells us about his mysterious trip to the Hot Lake Hotel in Oregon. This might be one of the scariest tales we've had yet. Good stuff, Maynard. Ethan from Australia chimes in with his contribution to the segment. Johnny, is this true? And add to it all this tale of blood gone bad from the five minute mystery. Another five minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by. Well, this mystery is actually pretty good, and I really don't have to make fun of it. Pretty rare for these often super silly stories. So, if it has to be brought to you by something, why not the word amazing? Here's the story. In a hospital on the east side, a dying patient gives a last expiring gasp. (coughs) He's gone. Slipped through my fingers like water running through a sieve. It's not your fault, Dr. Grant. You've done everything you could. The hospital certainly not failed. Nurse, this man should never have died. Something's wrong. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure that James Towner here did not die of the ailment he came to this hospital for. Nurse, I'm going to get permission to perform an autopsy. Your hunch was right, Dr. Grant. What is it? Tell me, Jones. When we tested Towner's blood in the lab, a foreign substance showed up immediately. I didn't recognize it, but one of my assistants seemed to think he knew what it was. So I let him make tests. A rare poison used only by the South American Indians was introduced into the bloodstream of the victim. It killed him, all right. But that's impossible, Dr. Grant. Jones, did your man say whether this poison could have been taken through food or... I thought of that, too. He swears it is the only effective way when it is taken directly into the bloodstream. And is there any antidote? Uh, Not known. My man says the Indians obtain a certain immunity by injecting themselves with small amounts over a long period of time. How could that poison have gotten into Towner's bloodstream? Doctor, I was with the patient every minute he was here. I could swear he had nothing intravenous during the whole time except the transfusions. Two of them which you ordered yourself. The transfusions? Who was the donor? Uh, Mr. Harkness, a friend of Towner's, happened to be visiting him. The friend immediately offered him blood. Towner was grateful and accepted. Harkness said something about his being the least he could do. We tested his blood and found it the right type, so we did the transfusion. I think we ought to investigate Harkness. But, Dr. Grant, I'm positive that Mr. Harkness did not even touch Mr. Towner during the whole time of his illness. If what I'm thinking is true, Harkness had something to do with the death of James Towner just the same. Well, we were certainly lucky, Doctor. There's no question about it. Harkness is your man. I knew it. I knew it. I've had Harkness investigated by the police. He's mentioned in Towner's will. Gets the whole estate. The police have searched his apartment and found just what I expected. I feel my medical judgment has been vindicated, Jonesy. You're right, Doctor. We're going to have this man Harkness arrested for the murder of James Towner. Do you know what the doctor and the laboratory technician discovered which indicated to them that Harkness murdered his friend Towner? The doctor will tell you in a moment. But first... Other than the acting being a bit campy, everything seems to be in order. But how did he do it? The nurse said he didn't get anything intravenously, but that can't be right, because he did get a complete blood transfusion. Hmm. Well, let's get back to the tale and see what the lab technician found. I'm rather curious. And now, back to our story. Well, Doctor, what have you found? The thing that indicated to me the fact that Harkness had a hand in the murder of James Towner was something Jones said when he spoke of the poison and the way the South American Indians gained immunity from it. I deduced that probably, against the chance that his so-called friend would need a transfusion, 
Harkness had so immunized himself over a period of time. If he had, the poison would still be in his blood in some quantity, small perhaps, but enough to react unfavorably on Towner in his condition. A police search verified my hunch. And now, Harkness is being tried for one of the most unusual murders that has ever come to my attention. Wow, that is one patient murderer. To wait around on a guy until he needed a transfusion? That is all kinds of patients. I mean, you would have to follow him around town asking, Hey man, how do you feel? Do you need some blood or something? Incredible. Hats off to the guy. In fact, this five-minute mystery is dedicated to our murderer. Here, here. Sweeney sent in this comment to the website. I love the podcast and never miss an episode, but I am confused. I subscribe to the show from the blog page and it only comes to my email box. I would like to be able to take the show with me on my iPod. What can I do about that? Gerald. Okay, Gerald, there are so many ways to get the show onto your iPod, but not knowing what computer you have makes it hard for me to give you exact instructions. So the generic answer is to install iTunes onto your computer, if you haven't already. Go to the podcast store and subscribe to Ron's Amazing Stories. It's totally free, and once you've done this, you'll have the option to download the podcasts onto your iPod. Keep in mind that some operating systems do not support iTunes, and to solve that dilemma is a bit more complicated. By the way, if you are an iTunes or Apple podcast user, please take a minute and leave a rating and or comment about the show. This is the best way to make the podcast grow. Statistics indicate that in the months of April and May, some 8,915 of you downloaded the podcast from Apple. If all of you left a review, well, the only thing that comes to my mind is... Wow! (laughs) I'm starting a brand new project here at the podcast. We get a lot of stories from you guys on the show. But many of you write to me and say that you don't have a story to tell. I have trouble believing that, but that's okay. How would you like to write a fiction story for the podcast? That's right, your story doesn't have to be true to be good. Here's my idea. Of course, if you've already written a short story, I'd love to have it. But if you're up for a challenge, how about you use the contact page at ronsamazingstories.com and tell me that you want to write a story. I will give you a concept and you run with it. I will even help you edit your story to make it the best it can be. When you're done with it, send it back and whiz bang boom, you or I will read your work on the show. If you think this sounds like something you want to try, head to ronsamazingstories.com and contact me. I can't wait for someone to be the first to take this challenge. It could be you. Ron's Amazing Stories is also an on-air radio show. We're on every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Pacific. That's 11 p.m. Eastern. Coming in October of 2018, the radio show and the podcast will be parting company. In other words, for the most part, they will no longer have the same content. Stay tuned for more information and for stations in your area, head to amfm247.com. And now, these are your stories. story is called Oregon's Hot Lake Hotel and was sent in to us by Tyler Wilfred. Hello Ron. 
first, let me say that you have one of the most unique podcasts out there. I found you by accident. I was searching the internet for amazing stories for a book I'm writing, and you popped up. I got to listening and found that I love the show. As a blogger, I travel the world looking for ghost stories. I never thought that I would have one of my own. It happened in your backyard of Oregon. The Hot Lake Hotel in Union City is about 10 miles from La Grande, Oregon, and may be one of the most mysterious and fascinating places I've ever been to. The area was first discovered in 1812 by Robert Stewart of the Wilson Price Hunt Party. Native American tribes used the nearby hot springs as a place to nurse their injured or sick on neutral ground. Then, in the 1840s, Hot Lake became a resting place for families who were traveling along the Oregon Trail. The first hotel was constructed in 1864 and was complete with bathhouses, a post office, dance hall, barber shop, and even a blacksmith. Until 1884, this isolated hotel was relatively unknown. This was the year that the Union Pacific Railroad put Hot Lake on the map, linking Oregon with the transcontinental system and started attracting visitors worldwide. The property continued to grow, and in 1908, the 105-room brick building was completed. The second floor was made up entirely for guests, where for $2.50 you could stay for the night and enjoy a meal for just 25 cents more. In 1917, Dr. Fee purchased the property. Under the new owner's direction, the hotel took on a dual purpose, housing a hospital on the third floor, complete with a surgery and rooms for patients. He renamed the resort to Hot Lake Sanatorium and began experimenting with the geothermal waters to treat various ailments. Between 1924 and 1934, the resort-slash-hospital caught worldwide attention as the hotel averaged 124 new guests every day. Unfortunately, like many hotels of this era, on May 7th of 1934, a fire broke out and destroyed much of the resort, reducing it to roughly half the size it once was and leaving only the brick building standing. Due to the devastating fire and the depression, business was never the same at Hot Lake. During World War II, the location was used as a pilot school and nurse training center. Until 1975, it operated as a nursing home and asylum. When the nursing home closed, it became a restaurant and country western nightclub, but that closed due to lack of business. It wasn't until 1983 Dr. Lyle Griffith took over and started the Hot Lake Company, which was a bath and massage business. Well, that failed as well, and the hotel fell into ruin. In September of 2000, my sister and I drove to Oregon just to see this place. We toured the long-abandoned facility all by ourselves, and this is where my story begins. By this time, the Hot Lake Hotel had earned a reputation for being extremely haunted. Over the years, many witnesses claimed to have seen and heard strange things that they could not explain in and around the resort. Visitors often recount seeing spectral figures walking around the grounds. Strange voices, screams, whispering, and footsteps in the various parts of the hotel were just some of the things reported by guests. One of the more common stories was about a former gardener who committed suicide on the property. People report an apparition of a man wearing work clothes walking around the old swimming pool. When the resort first opened, a piano formerly owned by Robert E. Lee's wife was acquired and placed on the hotel's third floor. To this day, people hear this ghostly piano playing all by itself. As we walked around the hotel, we entered what must have been a grand suite. It was a large room, had an oversized tub in the bathroom, and a picture window that you could see what remains of Hot Lake. In fact, quite a breathtaking view. As we entered the room, both of us looked at each other. I was the first to speak. Can you feel that? My sister looked at me and confirmed. 
It was like the room was electric. Chills went through my body, and as I looked at my sister, I could see her hair begin to stand up on its own like some crazy Tesla machine. Then the door to the room slammed shut. I ran to the door and threw it open and looked down the hallway. Nothing, not a single person in sight, and no reasonable explanation as to why it closed. Then I heard my sister scream. Running back into the room, I found her on the floor completely shaken. She grabbed my arm and pulled herself up and said, Get me the hell out of here. We left the hotel, jumped into the car, and we didn't stop for anything or anyone until we were back in our motel in Union, Oregon. Later that evening, my sister recovered enough to tell me what had happened. She said that when I left, an apparition came in from the bathroom area, floated straight at her, and passed through her. The chill she felt was pure evil, and she nearly passed out. She fell to the floor, screaming. Neither I nor my sister ever went back to the hotel, and this story was never really told until now. Fast forward to 2003, and the Hot Lake Hotel was purchased by David and Lee Manuel. They spent millions of dollars over the next seven years restoring the property. In 2008, the west wing of the building collapsed. As of 2010, the building now functions as a bed and breakfast with dozens of restored rooms, a spa, restaurant, and a museum. That's my story, and I hope you use it for your show. I think it's pretty amazing. Tyler Wilford Well, Tyler, that is amazing, and I want to thank you for all the background information. Impressive. I also did a little research on the Hot Lake Hotel. If you go to their website, you will find a rather nice description of the hotel, but the only warning they give is that they don't have elevators or air conditioned in all rooms. No mention of ghosts, which probably is a good idea. Thank you for your story. That is one of the best we've ever had on Ron's Amazing Stories. Our second story this time comes again from my amazing brother in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. This is his fourth story sent to us, and he says he still has more. He will keep them coming as long as we keep reading them. I think I gotta spend more time in New Mexico. Here is Jim's story that he simply calls impossible. Lou Wallace, governor of the territory of New Mexico and author of the famous novel Ben-Hur, which he wrote while serving as governor, once observed, All things learned by experience elsewhere fail in New Mexico. To put it another way, the land of enchantment isn't like any place else. It's not just a matter of many villages that have been settled for more than a thousand years or a sky that is notably different from any other place on earth. And I've traveled enough to verify that as fact. The high strangeness of New Mexico is something directly and frequently experienced by everyone who lives here. If you haven't seen ghost lights along the Rio Grande, strange objects in the sky by night, or have the sun set, where it should not be, then you're definitely from out of town. This is a story about something completely impossible that I saw in a public place in the full light of day. My oldest son was attending a university located in a small town 80 miles south of Albuquerque. The town basically rolls up the sidewalks on weekends, so I would drive down to bring him home and return him to school on Monday morning. It was an easy trip on the interstate, and on this particular Monday I had dropped him off and was northbound halfway home. I came around a sweeping bend and was surprised to see two military-type flying creatures directly above the freeway. The first thing I noticed was how low they were, not much more than 500 feet above the road. The second thing that struck me was the odd combination of aircraft. 
One was a large helicopter, and the other was a tanker plane designed for in-flight fueling. As I drew closer, my surprise turned to shock when I saw that neither the helicopter nor the tanker were moving. They were both standing stock straight still right there above the freeway. I could accept that for the helicopter, but the tanker? Even that complete impossibility wasn't the end of it. A pipe connected the two aircraft, and I could see that the tanker seemed to be refueling the helicopter. My eyes weren't on the highway anymore, and I suspected the same were, was true for other drivers around me. I craned my neck as my car passed under whatever this was, and then I looked in the rearview mirror and still could see it. This continued until another turn around the base of a high mesa took it all out of sight. What I had seen made no sense of any kind. In this situation, I literally could not believe my own eyes. I heard claims that sometimes secret or highly strange vehicle could masquerade, often holographically, as familiar objects. I felt that this might have been the case here. Of course, what I had seen was so ridiculous, I couldn't report it. I wouldn't even know what to say. So the question naturally followed. What did the holograph, if that's what it was, conceal? The answer to that question could only be, who knows? But that led me to the real question. Why publicly expose whatever this was, image, or reality at all? You don't have to test a piece of new tech, if that's what this was, right above the freeway, and you don't have to put something even stranger in a public setting where it needs to be falsely presented in such a wild way. New Mexico has miles of land where no one has ever lived and there are no roads. Do your experiment, or whatever, there. I was left with just one thought, and it was chilling. Someone, government, or perhaps a visitor from out of town, was showing off. The message seemed to be, forget the laws of physics, mechanics, or even reason. They may apply to you, but we can do whatever we want, whenever we choose, and wherever we please. All you can do is look up in amazement. James from New Mexico Well, James, you were quite right. I have no explanation for what you saw. However, I did find pictures on Google that, that show refueling jets feeding helicopters. At first, I thought that to be impossible, but it appears they do it all the time. If you look at the show art for this week, you'll see such a picture. From what I gather, the jets slow to nearly stall speeds and the helo is able to connect. One thing is that they do this very high in the air and over non-populated areas. You know, like empty deserts. In fact, the picture I used was taken over Afghanistan. Wow. Thank you, Jim, for your story. It is a head-scratcher and a mystery for sure. If you want to have your story read on Ron's Amazing Stories, head to ronsamazingstories.com, click on the story submission banner, and send it in. We want to hear your stories, and we want to hear them now. Johnny, is this true? Okay, I like to surf the internet looking for stories and other oddities. I do this in the name of the podcast, but the truth is, it's fun to see what's out there. What you're about to hear is what I call... Johnny, is this true? I will tell you a story and then ask the question, did I make it up or is it true? Let's get started. Story 1 When Jim Wilson's father died in Natal, South Africa in April of 1967, both Jim living in England, and his sister Muriel, living in Holland, were informed. 
Muriel contacted her husband, who was on a business trip in Portugal, and he flew to South Africa straight away. He had to change planes in Las Palmas Airport in the Canary Islands. While there, he bought a postcard showing holidaymakers on Margate Beach, Natal. He sent it to Muriel. When it arrived, Muriel noticed something strange about the postcard. On the photograph, it showed her father walking up the beach. Is this an amazing coincidence or something I made up? Well, the truth is that I did, in fact, not make this up. This really did happen, and is one of those impossible things that simply unfolds. The village of Canito di Caronia on Sicily's north coast has been plagued by mysterious fires. The trouble began on January 20, 2004, when a TV caught fire. Then things in the neighborhood houses began to burn, including washing machines, mobile phones, mattresses, chairs, and even the insulation on water pipes. The electric company cut off all power, as did the local cable cars. But the fires continued. Experts of all kinds carried out tests, but no explanation was found. The village was evacuated in February, and then the fires stopped. However, when people returned in March, the fires resumed. Police ruled out a pyromaniac after they saw wires bursting into flames. Now, am I trying to burn you, or is this really happening? This is a bona fide fact and is really happening. The issues have slowed some over the years, but unexplained fires still occur from time to time, and the villagers have pretty much learned to live with them. Other bizarre events have taken place as well. There were unexplained leaks from water pipes of three different houses. A vanity mirror in a bathroom caught fire three times in 35 hours, and an entire plantation of eggplants developed rainbow-like colors, making them unfit to be sold. This is very hard to believe, but there are some amazing photographic evidence to back this one up. How about that? Story 3 Norman Randall of Chicago, Illinois, works for a home repair service. His company would come in and make repairs to homes to bring them up to code so that they might be resold. One afternoon, he was told to meet a new client at his residence. Norman arrived a few minutes early and decided to get a head start and walk around the property. He was surprised to find a 50s bomb shelter in the backyard. Not being able to help himself, he opened the door and climbed down into it to explore. When he got inside, the cast iron door slammed shut from above and locked. He was engulfed in darkness and could not figure out how to reopen the door. When the homeowner arrived, he found no sign of Norman, so he left. He didn't think much about it, and it wasn't until three weeks later he called Norman's company. He was told that Norman had disappeared and he had not been seen since the day he was to meet with the homeowner. Having a hunch, he went to the house and opened the bomb shelter's door. There was Norman, alive and well. Norman was able to survive on 20-year-old food bags and condensation he licked off of the iron walls. Is this story a Chicago fact or... A total bomb. If you said true, then you didn't think it through. Condensation on the walls? Even I couldn't make that up. Oh, wait. I did. Gotcha. Story 4. Ethan Cooper of Sydney, Australia, sent in this story. This is our first submission from Down Under. I checked the podcast stats and was surprised to learn that we've had 623 downloads from Australia in the months of April and May. 
How about that? Ethan writes, In Sydney, we have some very strange but true stories. One of my favorites is about a man who thought he could fly. James Devlin is a daredevil of sorts. He would climb tall buildings, get caught, do some jail time, and then plan his next target. He has become a bit of a legend here. One night, he climbed to the top of the highest wing of the opera house, strapped on a homemade glider with the goal of safely landing in Sydney Harbor. With onlookers present, he jumped off only to have his wings fold up like an accordion. At that height, everyone thought he was doomed. At the very last second, the wings flew open and he landed hard, but did not die. He suffered broken ribs and a collapsed lung, but lived to go back to jail again. Now, is Ethan making this story up, or was it front page news down under? Well, Mike, if you said that this one happened, you're a few stubbies short of a six-pack and a few sandwiches short of a picnic. Ethan completely made this one up, and he doesn't even feel bad about it. Many thanks, Ethan, for sharing this story, fake as it might be. Do you have any strange but true stories you want to share? If you do, send them to ronsamazingstories at gmail.com and I'll use them if I can. Our main story for this week comes from the old-time radio series, The Inner Sanctum. This is a horror and mystery all rolled into one. It stars the narrator, Raymond, having his very own bout with strangeness. The quality on this one was a little beat up, so I did some restoration work on it, and it is my hope that you enjoy it. The tale is called Dead Man's Vengeance and first aired on October 10th, 1944. Good evening, friends. This is your host, Raymond. Welcome to the squeaking door of the inner sanctum. For those of you who write in to find out why our door squeaks so much. I guess now is a good time as any to explain that the hinges are rusty with dried blood. Through that door passed the most beautiful ghouls in the world. Won't you come in? You must scream to it with your mouth closed so you won't annoy the rest of your family. <laughs> you know, you don't need dark old houses or murky graveyards to feel the chilly presence of being from the other world. Uh, last week, just after I completed my broadcast, I was called to the telephone and I picked up the receiver I heard. Hello, is that you, Raymond? Yes. Yeah. Are you going to be at home tonight? Oh, uh, yes. Why do you ask? Because I'm going to drop by. Something I want to ask you about. Try to be alone. Uh, who are you? Don't you remember me? Well, the voice is familiar, but I can't quite place it. I'm Gideon Blake. I'll see you later, Ray. Goodbye. Now, there's nothing unusual about a call like that. Except one thing. Ten years ago, my friend Gideon Blake was killed. I was sure that call was some joke. I remember laughing about it as I sat down in my living room with sandwich and glass of milk. But uh, later that night, I must have dozed off. I remember being awakened by the tower clock chiming. It was midnight. Somewhere a cat howled against the moaning wind that had sprung up. Strange chills and a shudder through my body. 
front door must have blown open. I went to see. Standing there was Gideon Blake. Good evening, Raymond. Blake. You shouldn't be so surprised. I told you I was coming. Yes. You've changed so. It's been a long time. More than ten years, I believe. But I... I don't understand. You were burned to death. How on earth did you come back? There are many things which you will never understand while you're alive and on this earth. Why'd you come here? To give you this piece of paper. Hmm? What's on it? The names of four persons. They are alive now. In a short time, they will all be dead. I looked at him carefully as he talked. He looked hideous, ugly, with horrible burns on his face. The man had the look, touched the very smell of death. Good night, Raymond. I looked at the slip of paper my friend Gideon had given me. There were four names. Stella Marlowe. Robert Lane. Amelia Cardway. Raymond Edward Johnson. The first three names I didn't know. The last was very familiar to me. It was my own name. No, thanks. What about that piece of paper I gave you? How'd you get it? I told you. Look, I'm a cop, Raymond. When I believe a story like that one, you can call the little men in the white coats. Oh. No, I'm sorry I bothered you, Inspector. Let's forget it. <laughs> I can't forget it. Why? Because Blake wrote that note. Are you sure? We checked the handwriting. It's his. So are the fingerprints we found on it. How do you figure it? I don't yet. I am waiting for you I to tell you everything. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Maybe Blake's really alive. He got burned to death ten years ago. Are you sure? Positive. We checked every angle of his death at that time because we thought he might have been murdered. Murdered? I never heard about that. Oh, Blake was with the department. You remember? Working on a homicide case. The Laura Wilcox case, you remember? Oh, uh, vaguely. We figured someone might have polished him off, but nobody did. It was an accident. Was this Wilcox murder ever solved? Well, uh, no. Maybe those names I gave you have something to do with the Wilcox case. Why don't you check with I did. None of your names figure. These people never heard of the Wilcox murder. Hey, Inspector. Yeah, what do you want, Gibson? Hey, weren't you interested in some information about a dame named Stella Marlowe? Yeah. She was the first name on that list you gave me, Ray. Hmm. Uh, what about her? I just came through on the ticker. Stella Marlowe was found dead. Murdered. <laughs> I just got in. I've been down to the police library studying the file on the Wilcox case. All right, forget about that. Now, listen. I want you to lock your door and all the windows. I'm sending down a red-headed cop to guard you. What? Don't let any dark-haired guy into your house, even if he's your own best friend. What's this all about? We're dealing with a homicidal maniac. The body of Stella Marlowe was dismembered. Dismembered? Tell my man to call me at headquarters when he arrives. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> After I hung up the phone, I noticed the little black box on the living room table. How it got there, I don't know, because my house was locked all day. I undid the black ribbon, opened it. I saw inside. Back in it, it horrified me. It was a human hand. Suddenly a thought clicked in my mind. I recognized something on the hand. This is Ray Johnson. Yeah, what is it? Did you ever find out what happened to Stella Wilcox? Huh? She's the stepdaughter of the murdered Laura Wilcox. Why do you want to know? Well, she was suspected of the murder for a time. Listen, will you drop that angle? Will you just answer one or two questions? Did the killer dismember the whole body in the Stella Marlowe murder? Just the hands. Fine. Did she have on a large diamond ring, the third finger on the left hand? Yes. 
men say she wore it all the time, but how do you... I've got it here. Someone sent me a hand with a ring on it. What? And get this. There's a name engraved inside the ring. The name is Laura Wilcox. What? There's a scar on the thumb. There was a scar on the left thumb of Stella Wilcox's print in your file. I took a fingerprint. The prints on the hand and the fingerprints of Stella Wilcox are identical. Are you sure? Yes. Stella Marlowe and Stella Wilcox are the same person. Did you find anything else there? Yes. Black hair and the fingernails. I'm coming down to your place as fast as I can get there. Goodbye. Goodbye. The front door slammed the second after I hung up. I turned around. Coming toward me was a man with jet black hair. <laughs> You know, I can say sudden horrible death when it happens to other people, but when it happened to me, well, the man with the jet black hair looked quietly at me and said, I'm Robert Lane. You're Raymond Edward Johnson, I believe? Yes. Inspector Bell spoke to me about you. Can I sit down? What do you make of all this? I don't know what to make of it. You heard what happened to Stella Marlowe? Yes. You know that's not her real name? Yes, she was the stepdaughter of Laura Wilcox, but uh, how do you know? I think I know more about this than you imagine. Is your name really Robert Lane? Why? There was a chauffeur in the Wilcox home, a man named Lowry. I wonder if... There's no harm in telling you now. Yeah, I'm that chauffeur. And Amelia Cardway? She was Mrs. Wilcox's maid. You know, Johnson, the murder of Stella didn't come exactly as a surprise to me. Why? She poisoned her stepmother with the help of the maid, Amelia Cardway. But why am I involved in all this? Let's not fool each other. Somehow you discovered that Stella murdered her stepmother. But after ten years, you can't dig up any evidence, and you know it. So you invent this wild story about Gideon Blake. Just the right sort of psychological scare to frighten the two women into making a move that'll give them away. Very clever. Just a moment. What color is the hair of Amelia Cardway? Blonde. Pretty shade of blonde, in fact. Very attractive girl ten years ago. Oh, what's in the box? I advise you not to look. I rarely follow the advice of other people. I... Oh. Where'd you get this? Someone left it here this evening. That ring. Old Lady Wilcox gave that to Stella on her 18th birthday. That... The hand of Stella. I understand why you asked about the hair, Johnson. That hair under the fingernails is black. Just like mine. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if an analysis showed that it was mine. And you killed it. The point is that I don't intend to give up my life to amuse you and your little crime hobby. What do you mean? You're going to learn about crime, Raymond, through a direct personal experience. I'm going to kill you. Don't go on me. I... He was a powerful man. His blow dazed me. I struck my head against the furniture. I lay down on the floor dazed. Like a slow motion picture, I saw Lane approach and lean over me. A long knife in his hand. You didn't expect to stir up this hornet's nest, did you? Crime and murder is very amusing, isn't it? Well, you'll find out just how funny it is. He don't raise his arm. Not powerless. He was driving the knife down. Suddenly... Uh and scream. Somewhere the door slammed. And I blacked out. Here. Here, get up. Right. Mm-hmm. There you are. You're okay now. Come on, get up, get up. Inspector ah, Doyle. Hey, what happened here? I found you on the floor, out like a knife. There was Lane, the Wilcox chauffeur. He tried to kill me. Lane? Lane's dead. There's the body. Huh? Did uh, you kill him, Ray? No. Where does Amelia Cardway live? Oh. A few miles from here, why? We've got to get over there right away. She killed the old lady, and she might have killed Stella, too. I don't see how Amelia Cardway could have done it. Maybe you'll tell me next that Gideon Blake did it. I don't know. Gideon Blake didn't have a hair on his head. Oh, besides, he's dead. I never arrest a dead man for the crime of murder. 
Then get confessions out of him. Perhaps Lane did go to see Stella shortly before she was killed. They were all in this together. Yeah. They told you they didn't know each other to protect themselves. Now, that still doesn't explain how the hands got to your place or why Gideon Blake came back from the dead. Or why we found those black hairs under the fingernails. Yeah, I've got an idea about the hands. Yeah? I think it was dismembered so that you would never know that Stella Marlowe was Stella Wilcox. Huh? She changed her appearance, but she couldn't change her fingerprints. Well, then, who left it at your place and why? And why should you be on the murder list? Don't remind me of that, please. Well... Here's Amelia Cardway's cottage. Maybe we'll get some of the answers here. Come on. Ah! What? Inspector. Help! Help! You hear that? Yeah, yeah. Come on, follow me, right? Inspector Doyle had his gun out and was running into the house. I followed a few steps behind. In a moment, I was in the living room. Doyle was standing there. Right. Well, what happened? Why did you scream for help? In an old chair sat what was once an attractive woman. The blonde hair was streaked with gray, but the face was a mask of terror. I recognized her from the picture in the police file. It was the former maid of Laura Wilcox, Amelia Cardway. Yes, Mrs. Wilcox, in just a minute. Come in, Mrs. Wilcox. What's the matter with oh. her? Yeah, she's cracked your delirious. Just keep sitting there like that, mumbling. You can't live with secrets. Someone will find out. I'm glad. Glad they found out. Now she'll never come to see me again, ever. Yeah, well, who came to see you? Mrs. Wilcox. Uh, I didn't want to give her that medicine. I knew it was poison, but Stella made me. She made me. And so did me, the chauffeur. Getting out of the chair, Inspector. Uh, uh, look, there's a knife in her back. This card was... There she is, at the top of the stairs. Mrs. Wilcox. Where? At the top of the stairs, Inspector. Look, it's Laura Wilcox. I'll tell everything, Mrs. Wilcox. We were all in on it together. Tell her, the chauffeur and me. I didn't want to do it. Forgive me for... I'm going upstairs. You look after her, right? The moment he reached the bottom steps, Mrs. Wilcox disappeared. I stooped over the cardway woman. She was dead. A burst of pistol fire came from the upstairs part of the house. A moment later, Inspector Doyle came tumbling down the stairs, the gun still in his hand. He was unconscious. I looked up. At the top of the stairs stood Mrs. Laura Wilcox. She said nothing, but calmly came down, holding the poker she had struck the inspector with. She bent down, took out the knife from the body of the dead Amelia Cartwright. Too startled. Too frightened to move. Suddenly the woman took off her hat. Her wig. And there stood Gideon Blake. You'd better go now, Raymond. I don't understand that disguise. Look there. The entrance to the dining room. Fire. Yes. Fire. You'd best leave at once. Those flames are spreading rapidly. Take Inspector Doyle with you. Blake, you hurry. Yours is the last name on my list, you know. He didn't have to say any more. I dragged the inspector through the door. Gideon Blake turned, smiled at me, and walked directly into the flames. That was the last I ever saw. <laughs> found the missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. Laura Wilcox was a twin sister of Gideon Blake. We uh, dug up the birth records. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why she looked so familiar. And that's why he murdered the three people. Because they killed his sister. He faked his own death in order to carry out justice himself. Yes, but that uh, still doesn't explain why I was brought into it. Uh -huh. a bit. <laughs> that's simple. He wanted us to know what was going on so that we didn't hold some innocent person. Mm -hmm. uh, just one more question. Yeah, go ahead. How did Blake fake his own death ten years ago? Uh, well, uh, now, we don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but he he must have done it. Uh, did you find his body in the ashes of Amelia Cardway's cottage? Mm hmm? Mm, well, I guess they're there, but... Uh, 
Well, it's impossible to identify them positively. Yeah, that leaves one other explanation. What's that? That Gideon Blake actually died ten years ago. <laughs> of advice, naturally. When you get killed, don't let your murderer slice your hands off. Because then you can never put the finger on it. <laughs> Good night. Pleasant dreams. Uh-huh. That was a very different role for our narrator, Raymond. I thought it was pretty suspenseful and well acted on all fronts. The Inner Sanctum Mysteries was an anthology series that featured stories of mystery, terror, and suspense. The early 1940 programs opened with Raymond Edward Johnson introducing himself as your host, Raymond. A spooky, melodramatic organ score, played by Lou White, punctuated Raymond's many morbid jokes and playful puns. Raymond's closing was an elongated, pleasant dreams, hmm? His tongue-in-cheek style and ghoulish relish of his own tales became the standard for every horror narrator to follow. Good stuff, Raymond. Well, that's the show for this time. I hope you had some fun. I want to thank our contributors this week, Gerald, Tyler, Jim, and Ethan, for your stories and comments. To everyone I say, if you have a question, story, or want to complain, I want to hear from you. To follow the blog or the podcast, it's easy to do. Just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you'll find all of the links you will need. We are on Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many, many other services. Pick one and do leave some feedback about the show. It really does help us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.